Thanks so much to, to Angie for organizing this session, and thanks to all of you for coming. It's going to be a really thrilling day, and uh, uh, I appreciate, Angie, your efforts in bringing us all together. It's going to be very exciting. So for the next 40 minutes, we're going to go on a guided tour, and the, we could go on a guided tour of the city as well, but this is going to be a guided tour uh, of AI and neuroimaging. So this will be directed at a few different levels. If you're new to AI, there should be some material that you'll enjoy. And if you're a mathematician, there should be some material that, that, that you'll enjoy. We'll talk about how AI is used in neuroimaging uh, today and what are the main methods. Uh, we'll talk about uh, 3D CNNs, vision transformers, VAEs, generative adversarial networks, and diffusion models. Um, I know Sergey and Chen are going to go into quite some depth. So this is going to be a high-level overview. And I think if you really want to know how they work, listen to Jing and Sergey a little bit later on. We'll talk about not just the methods, but what should I be careful of. And so there's some issues with training models that then don't work. So it'd be very bad if you had an algorithm that just didn't work. And we'll talk about how to avoid domain shift issues and, and, and an issue such as fairness, which sort of means that methods should work well for everyone. I mean, they shouldn't work just on a subclass of data. Hot topics include automatic diagnostics and explainable AI for identifying features in radiologic images, uh, generative AI, which we'll talk about, um, merging multiple data types, imaging, genomics, and text, things called vision language models. And then how do we adapt AI for other neuroimaging uh, modalities, maybe diffusion tractometry, resting state? I mean, some of the same methods need to be uh, adapted. So here's a standard setup of one branch of AI, uh, often known as discriminative AI. So you have inputs on the left, which might be neuroimaging, but they could also be genetics, clinical data, maybe even real-time data from an actigraphy watch. And you'd like to learn from this data how to make a decision. And so, you know, what is the person's diagnosis? If they have a certain disease, what's the prognosis? What's their treatment response going to be? So on the right, there might be some binary outcome or some prediction, uh, which takes all of the data on the left uh, and makes the conclusion on the right. And there's two reasons to do this. One is if you want to make the decision. If you're a radiologist, you want to make the decision. But as a neuroscientist, you want to discover features in the data that are helpful uh, for making the decision, and that's another reason to do it. So deep learning methods for imaging were initially developed in computer vision. Uh, they include convolutional neural networks, vision transformers, uh, variation autoencoders, uh, generative adversarial networks and, and latent diffusion models. There's a different type of AI method uh, that includes recurrent neural networks such as LSTMs or transformers that work with sequences. So sequences of text like words or sequences of the, of the genome. But the way to train them, at least for imaging, is pretty uh, general. So let's say in the lab you want to let in a, a, a lab member called Sarah and you have a lot of pictures of Sarah and you'd like to sort of have a neural network decide whether this is a picture of Sarah or somebody else, and you don't let the other people in. So a CNN will distill progressively more abstract features uh, from pictures of her face um, and try and find the ones that are distinctive of her and not distinctive of, of, of other people. And in medical imaging, we might be doing something related, like predicting a person's diagnosis, or uh, not usually who they are, but it might be something about them like their, their age. So 25 years ago, my first student was doing neural networks to segment the corpus callosum, and his committee didn't like it. They said, well, we don't like neural networks. Look at all of the problems with them. How can we see how it works? It has millions of parameters. I mean, was, the committee was unhappy about it. Or it will never work. I mean, that's kind of a bad thing. This is in 2003. And this would be called, this is Alain Petiot, this would be called a radiomics uh, artificial neural network where it's not actually learning the features, you're giving it some features and it has to decide what nonlinear combination of them in each, each pixel is the most uh, valuable. And then fast forward to Chao Gan and his lab. So he'll, he'll speak later, so I won't tell you anything about this. It's super cool. But his method with Vin Lu can tell if a person has Alzheimer's disease. And this is one of the largest brain imaging studies in the world. Uh, training a CNN to classify Alzheimer's disease. So it certainly works, and this is pretty exciting. Um, just the diagnosis is challenging enough, but you could train on in vivo neuroimaging and neuropath, and the neuropathology might be interesting. Uh, it could identify features we can't see with neuroimaging, such as TDP43, Lewy bodies, angiopathy, uh, maybe amyloid and tau. So Dugo Tosun has been using paired training of in vivo imaging and postmortem pathology here with a random forest, which is actually a little simpler machine learning method that gives you really high accuracy in uh, telling what molecular pathology 
uh, is in the brain. Um, this is kind of a funny application, so I'm going to talk about applications first. AI that reads brain scans shows promise for finding Alzheimer's genes. So the idea here is you run an AI classifier uh, of Alzheimer's disease on 100,000 images, um, and then you run its opinion of how much Alzheimer's disease there is through a genome-wide association analysis. And people have done this, so Taiho Zhou and Andy Sakin have said in Tau Pet what features predict Alzheimer's disease, and you can light them up, and then you can go grab the signal in that area in a huge database of people, and then search the genome here with a CNN that goes along your genetic sequence to find markers that are associated with more amyloid in the brain. So this is kind of a nice hybrid imaging genetic uh, approach. So one criticism of deep learning is you need a lot of data. So how do we know if we have enough data uh, to train a deep learning method? And the performance of these deep learning methods does depend on the amount and diversity of data. Um, it depends on the uh, model architecture and the in ingenuity of the developer, how much data you need. Some tactics include pre-training the neural networks, um, how the training data is used, things like curriculum learning, adaptive learning, reinforcement learning, pass the training data through the neural network uh, in different ways. And even if the network does great, I mean, maybe it won't work on the next batch of data. So things like correctly avoiding overfitting, deconfounding, handling domain shifts are, are very important. So let, let's look at a handful of neural networks. So this is going to be a competition, like who can detect Alzheimer's disease uh, most accurately or with the least data. And I'll just show you the winners uh, and the not so good methods. So as more training data was used, this is T1 MRI, and you're trying to tell if the patient has Alzheimer's or not. And it's, it's easy. There's no other diseases that are being shown in the test uh, case. Some methods, like 2D CNNs, um, max out at about 78% accuracy. They're, they're never very good. I mean, maybe it would get a bit better. Whereas 3D CNNs with uh, semi-supervised contrastive learning, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, can achieve 91% accuracy. And may maybe you guys can think of even better ones. I mean, it's kind of cool. But what often happens is you don't have, I mean, this is trained on 2,500 MRIs. Xiao Gans was trained on 80,000 MRIs. But you often, oops, I'm wrecking the place, sorry. Um, you, you often might not have more than 100 data sets. And so we, we want to know which methods do well on limited data. So this paper by Nikhil Dinagar in our group benchmarked lots of deep learning ar architectures for detecting Alzheimer's and found the best models were 27 million parameter vision transformers, which the committee of my first graduate student would be very unhappy with because of the amount of parameters. Uh, so we'll just talk about why some of these methods do better and, 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 and how they work. So th these are actually sold. I mean, you, if you write one of these methods, a uh, radiologist might buy it. This, this uh, FDA-approved dementia detector, uh, you, you can buy it. You can buy a license for it. And this, this group of researchers formed a startup, got six million in funding from uh, Y Combinator, and now their method is sold. And so it's kind of cool. Um, so let's have a look at how they work. I, I know Sergey and, and, and Xing are going to talk about this in more detail. It's a very high-level summary of CNNs. So, in a standard CNN, you might input an image, the whole 3D image, and a series of, of, of layers will compute mathematical functions on the image. And if it's a convolutional neural network, there'll be successive layers of filters or feature detectors or filter kernels. And you can say, well, how do we know what they are? Well, they're, they're learned. So the parameters of the feature detector are actually tuned during the training of these algorithms to find things that are useful uh, for making a decision. And so this is just a video. You can look at, watch the video if you want. This is a fully connected multi-layer perceptron. It's not a CNN. But the image comes in on the left. All of these units compute mathematical functions of their inputs, usually with an inner product of a layer of weights and a bias B. And there's loads of layers of these. Um, and initially, they're set to random values. But you can adjust this function during, during training. And they're trained via back propagation. So for many of you know this, but the weights are updated during training uh, using stochastic gradient descent by passing training data through the network in mini batches. Um, and basically, you decide how to adjust the weights by choosing the adjustment that improves the training error. So you ask the network, did, did, did it get right who had Alzheimer's and who didn't? And if tuning the weights in a certain direction improves that on the training data, you make that uh, adjustment. And then you stop when the validation set loss no longer decreases. So you hold out a little bit of data, see how, the, how it's going, and when that no longer decreases, you, you stop. And uh, this is kind of cool. I wanted to show you a, a film of this in, in, in action. If I, 
can get it to work. Yeah, there you go. So th th this is a CNN train to, um, if you write handwritten digits, like which one is it? Like maybe a zip code on a letter. I guess letters aren't really sent anymore. But if you, if you wrote, wrote numbers, I mean, it'd be useful if a machine could tell what the numbers are. And uh, because people write numbers in sort of careless ways and not exactly the same, uh, it'd be great if the letter didn't go to the wrong address. So um, this is um, where CNNs began. So Yann LeCun and, and the, the early developers of computer vision methods uh, trained them to do that task, and it's really pretty good. If we swap the digits for MRIs, let's say epilepsy, healthy people, Alzheimer's, you could say, well, first of all, does it work? And second of all, what features are, uh, are useful? So let's say a CNN is being trained to say, what side is the seizure focus in someone with medial temporal lobe epilepsy, either left or right? You can ask which parts of the brain, the hippocampus, or maybe something else, or maybe all of the brain were helpful in making that decision. And so interpretable AI is the subfield of AI that gets a trained neural network and asks it which features either in all of the data or in a particular individual were, were helpful. And there's a few methods of explainable AI or, or you know, finding features that were helpful. Ex occlusion sensitivity analysis, grad cam, layer-wise relevance propagation, or if you're using vision transformers, uh, attention flow. So the simplest is occlusion sensitivity analysis. So let's say the CNN works. Let's say you cover up little patches of the data and you, you go, oh no, the accuracy went really down when I covered up the ventricles. That can be lit up. So the gradient of the test error with respect to the occlusion of each uh, region uh, gives you a salience map. Um, and uh, I mean, there's a dog. And we used its head to decide it was a dog. We didn't use the grass, or you shouldn't use the grass. And so uh, occlusion sensitivity analysis covers up the input layer in blocks. And in the uh, input layer, it, it, it tells you how much difference having that little patch made to the classification uh, accuracy. And you can do this with videos. You could say, find all the videos of boxing. Let's say you want to find a video of someone boxing. And it'll find the person punching, or maybe find the red glove, or something like that. It, it works very well. So a, a CNN and saliency analysis can be applied to 3D images, 4D images, videos, even Netflix videos, if you, if you, if you want. The other end of the CNN can also be queried. So GradCam will cover up the last layer of the CNN. So once everything's been put together, the very last layer of a CNN has lots of channels. It, it has features that have been derived, presumably, that are helpful. And then weighted by the uh, weightings that they have in the classification, it can weight the outputs of the last layer. So you can say, well, OK, Paul, I, I, I don't know whether I should look at the end or the beginning. I mean, which, which one should I use? If you use GradCam, which is the gradient of the classification probabilities with respect to occlusions of the last layer, um, I mean, you would ask it where the cat is, it does a good job. Where's the dog, it uses its head. Where's the person brushing their teeth, it sort of finds the toothbrush. Uh, and where's, where, where is someone cutting? It does a good job. I mean, GradCam does a good job. But for imaging, it's a little bit tricky because it, it works, but it's limited by the resolution of the last uh, convolutional layer. So if you say, find images with glioma and light them up using GradCam, I mean, that glioma is found, but the pituitary tumor, I mean, a radiologist is not going to be very pleased if you say that's where the tumor is, and it's in the pituitary. So hybrid grad cam uh, methods that look at all of the layers of the CNN uh, are the most typically used. This paper by uh, Vince Calhoun's lab uh, trains a CNN to detect schizophrenia in resting state fMRI, which sounds quite difficult. And what he does is he... Um, reads in uh, various uh, canonical uh, um, resting state networks, and then asks the CNN which parts of these networks were helpful in, in detecting schizophrenia. And he found that the early layers of the CNN uh, emphasized the edges of neural networks. The later layers emphasized the activations inside the, the CNN. So this is kind of a nice discovery method. So let's jump back a step. So we talked about these different architectures. How do we pick which one? is going to be useful. Like, is that one always the winner? Should we always use that one, or does it depend uh, on the problem? So old CNNs had people pick what features went in. So let, let's say edges, or Haar filters, or Gabor filters. You, you can actually decide what goes into the neural network. And radiologists used to like this. They, they're called radiomic methods. Because it would say, well, you know what? The texture is different in this MS patient. Or we think that the, uh, 
the histogram is different in this person with white matter lesions. And so there was a very easily built-in interpretability test when the classifier picks one of the features you set in. The problem is you run out of ideas on what the features should be. And if you were to let the CNN discover the features itself, and I mean, in a little kernel, pick the weights and decide, you can have a much more, uh, well, a much larger set of features that could be useful. If you only show it 2D images, so this is a hybrid CNN. The CNN works on 2D images, and then a recurrent neural network called a long short-term memory network puts the opinions of the classifier on each of those 2D images uh, into an aggregate decision. You get to 78% accuracy on Alzheimer's disease. Uh, DenseNet, which is a clever approach, it stacks all the layers. So instead of the successively higher order filtering, uh, like a relay race, them being passed from one to the next, it takes every layer you have so far and just builds them all up into a huge filter uh, set at the end. That does very well, 91% accuracy. And you'll see people trying different things. So it's a little bit like AI is, is training us. So people that did standard uh, CNNs added residual connections, found that the back propagation uh, was more stable. Then they did this dense net business where every layer of the CNN is brought along and used that at the, at the last layer. So vision transformers, which uh, split images into tokens, little patches, 16 by 16 patches, um, can be fed into transformers. Now transformers were invented by a fellow who worked in our building at USC, uh, Ashish Vis Viswani. And for five years, I said to him, Ashish, is your language translation project going well? And he hadn't invented this at this stage. He invented this at Google. And he said, no, it's going terribly. <laughs> the, the machine translation isn't working. But the transformer was written for text, sequence to sequence AI, either translating it or answering a question. But you can put patches in from images. And uh, although that doesn't seem like it'd be a good idea, you can tokenize images, and it does pretty well. They need a little more data than CNNs. And so unless they're heavily pre-trained, the accuracy doesn't reach uh, competitive performance with CNNs until you have a lot of data. The other sort of secret here is you don't train these networks from scratch usually. You don't say, here's a blank CNN with random weights, and here's some images. You will pre-train it on another task. And then you'll take the pre-trained networks with, with weights frozen. You're not going to change those. And only allow the training on medical data to change some of the, some of the weights. And so let, let's give you an example. So Fei Fei Li, a professor at Stanford, wanted to have a competition called the ImageNet uh, to label things in these images. So many of you might know that's the Norwegian flag. Uh, you know, if, if we asked everyone in this room to identify them, we'd get maybe 90%. Or maybe together we'd get nearly 100%. This was a contest where you could enter a competition starting in 2012, and you could enter your neural network, see how well it did. This is the top one accuracy. It gets up to about 90% accuracy. Um, and AlexNet, which was written by Alex Krzyzewski and Ilya Sutskeva and, and other famous uh, neural net people, really showed that this was going to be possible. So that's AlexNet, uh, that rather deep uh, convolutional neural network on, on the right. And so what you do when you train CNNs on medical data is you usually start with one of these. So you don't have to just start with the medical data. And then um, you can select them from a library. And so much like that beautiful library in the mall uh, downstairs, these are all the CNNs that have been trained on photograph identification. That data set had 10 million images. They've been pre-trained. The big dots are ones with a lot of parameters. The little dots are ones with not many parameters. The y-axis is how well it labels photographs. The x-axis is how much compute time in gigaflops was needed to train it. And something like VGG19, we'll come back to for brain imaging uh, in a minute, it, it does pretty well. It's a big network, but it does pretty well. So often these prototypes are fine-tuned for medical imaging tasks. And VGG19 just means the visual geometry group developed it. It has 19 layers, and there it is. And all those uh, little dots that compute functions, they're usually little bricks. So the, the other model where we had... Uh, you know, wires connected together, they're usually like little slates. And it's sometimes shown like this. So VGG19 just means there's a lot of layers, there's usually a downsampling uh, by the end of, of the neural network, and then a fully connected layer makes the decision of whether this is a dog or a cat or someone with, with Alzheimer's. Decisions to make if you want to train CNNs to detect disease in 3D brain MRI. So brain MRI is a 3D, or if you're in a functional imaging lab, 4D. Uh, not 2D, so should we stick with the 2D CNNs and see if we can fine-tune them? 
transfer learning is this business, should we just use ImageNet, which is photographs, uh, or should we pre-train on UK Biobank, or like Chow Gans lab did, all the data in the world. <laughs> and uh, contrastive learning, and this is kind of a funny technique. This one did the best. So contrastive learning is strange, and I, I, I think Jing and Sergei will tell you more about this. Rather than train on some labeled data, it augments the data. It says, well, this image of an Alzheimer's patient, maybe tomorrow they're gonna have a darker image or some of it missing. So you occlude and rotate and flip the data coming in and you say, I'd really like the classification to give the same answer on all of the perturbed augmented versions of this data. And this actually does the best, at least for Alzheimer's classification, because it builds in a little bit of invariance uh, to the types of uh, differences that you'll see. So I'm not gonna go into great detail, but this was the best method, simply or MoCo, uh, and you can read the papers on how that is, is, is trained. Now let's have a look at this, this is fun. We're gonna move to generative AI. So how many of you have seen this? Any, anyone in the audience? See? Uh, Andre has seen this. Has any, anyone else? I'll run, it, I'll run it again, it's kind of fun. It's making a synthetic brain. So isn't that wonderful? It will take noise and make a synthetic brain. Okay, so this is work by Walter Pinaya and George Cardoso um, on a gener generative AI, AI method that will make brains. That's kind of cool. So it'll train on MRI data, in this case T1 data, and it'll make a brain of the prescribed brain size, ventricular volume. Uh, it can generate brains of a certain age and sex. And synthetic MRI generation could be quite useful because you might run out of money to scan real people. Maybe because that contrastive learning method did better when it was augmented, maybe we could give these brains to train uh, the real data. So how, how does this work? I mean, can we really make brains and do we agree they look like brains? So if you want to hear the full gory details, Mackay and CVPR have a four-hour course on diffusion models for medical imaging. So I'll, I'll do the five-minute version. So generative AI does not take complex input and give one decision as the output. It takes input that might not be complex, like show me a cat, it could be a text sentence, and it creates an instance of a cat or an instance of a brain, and the input describes what type of uh, output you'd like to generate. The simplest form of this is a data compression technique called a variational autoencoder. So let's say we put in an input of this rather splendid cat, and then we put it through a neural network with a very narrow bottleneck. Now, you're very familiar, I'm sure, with data reduction techniques. If you have very high dimensional data like an image, you could use PCA, ICA, and then work with the latent space. You could work with less parameters than you came in with. So a variational autoencoder passes the input data through a very narrow layer, and then it expands it back out again. And it trains it so that it perfectly reproduces the input, or as close as possible. So what we're gonna end up with is some weights in this first part of the network called the encoder that can take a cat and then not having much data, it can make the whole cat. So that's kind of cool. It's a nonlinear dimension reduction technique that maps the input images into a lower dimensional latent space. And if you're familiar with PCA, you're 90% of the way towards uh, un understanding this. So when you run this on MNIST, so MNIST is a, a computer vision training set of, of handwritten digits, and they're black and white. They don't have all the colors and richness of brain images. If you run these through a variational autoencoder and you look at those two inner parameters and you say, what does it output when I set the parameter to be this value or the other parameter to be this value, you'll get nicely organized digits. So it's taken all of the complexity and you can have a, a, a um, bottleneck layer that's two parameters or you can have more likely you know, 19 or 20, it might describe the thickness of the digits. And one of the nice things is that a standard autoencoder will tend to put all these digits in discrete areas of the latent space. They'll put the ones over here, the twos over here. But a variational autoencoder will stretch out the data across the latent space so that uh, it maps onto a so-called multivariate Gaussian, uh, which is easy to sample from. So let, let's look at where these number sevens went. They went into a certain patch of this uh, flattened uh, latent space. Uh, the number ones might be close by because they look like sevens. The number eights might be further away because they don't look anything uh, like sevens. And so when you train a variational autoencoder, variational autoencoder training forces the latent variables that are in the middle, and they're going to be decoded back out into digits. It forces those latent variables to do two things. One is they have to reconstruct what you put in. So when you do the embedding, a good embedding is going to be one way you can reconstruct what you put in. The second one is 
you want to have a multi-dimensional Gaussian structure. Why do, why do you want to have that? It looks like a, a kind of 2D Gaussian there. We can make up 2D Gaussian vectors very easily. You can simulate them. Go and find the point in the latent space and then expand it back out to the digit. And it'll make new digits. It'll generate uh, all sorts of digits. Um, when you train these, there's a very simple objective function. I mean, they, that, that doesn't look very simple, but I mean, a computer can calculate those quantities very quickly. That middle term is the so-called kullback leibler divergence between the latent space, the embedding you've created, and an uh, n-dimensional Gaussian. Uh, it reduces to um, very simple algebra in the case of a, a Gaussian. And the term on the right is the uh, it was log likelihood. It's how far the distribution uh, is going in modeling the true data. It's the discrepancy uh, between the uh, produced images, the fake images, and the real images uh, on the training data. Now, what's cool about this is, let's say you input an image and cover some of it up. So that's Venice, that's a rock concert. Um, how on earth did it put the band in? And so the, the, the idea is you give it the image with a pink square over it, and you say, can you please, on the out, output of the variation auto encoder, fill in your best estimate of what was covered up? And you think, well, this is crazy. It's filled in the bird correctly. I mean, maybe not great. The bird looks a bit pink. But um, in the case of the band, you think, well, it, wh why is this so much better than PCA-based in-painting? So it, 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 if you're used to doing something called imputation in statistics, if you have missing data, you often run PCA on the input data. Um, and you might say, well, this person was missing this data. Let's reconstruct what data they would have using the PCA of the in input. And it would do terribly. It would be really blurry. So why, why is this VAE generating high-quality, realistic data? Now, you could argue about details, but it's pretty good. And the insight, the gestalt shift that made this much better than PCA was to put in an extra reconstruction loss term that evaluates whether or not it's done a good job. So let's look at faces. Let's, let's make faces. We'll run a variational autoencoder. We'll make a latent space that represents all faces, maybe smiling, not smiling, different uh, ethnicity, different age. For better reconstruction, you can train the VAE not just with these two terms, which are the fidelity uh, of the output on the training data and the resemblance uh, between your latent space and a multidimensional Gaussian. Those are the usual two terms. You add a perceptual loss, and that uses our friend the VGG19CNN. So the VGU19 CNN is an object detector. It'll tell you whether something is a cat or a dog, and it's really good. And you can run your image through it and look at all of the layers. And if your image is lousy and very blurry, the VGG CNN says, I don't think this looks like anything. It doesn't resemble a cat or a dog or anything I've seen. It's just not very good. So the extra term in a variation autoencoder that led to them being much more high fidelity in generating realistic images was to ask a trained object detector what it thought. And not just what class it is, because we don't really care about what class it is. Is the, and we'll go back to the definition, is the perceptual loss reasonable? In other words, when you ask a VGG CNN, does this look like a realistic object? Do the layers re respond in the way that they would for a real object? Now, this is a really huge, uh, this is a nice paper to read about this. This is a really huge leap in generative AI. If you look at what a straight VAE does, which is blurry, and a VAE trained with perceptual loss, it looks like a face. And so this is, I mean, maybe three years ago, generative AI uh, was, was making this type of, of image. So let's train um, a VAE with um, callback Leibler divergence on the difference between the latent embedding and a multidimensional Gaussian, a reconstruction loss, the L2 norm in the image space, and a perceptual loss, which asks the VGG19 CNN whether it looks like an object. And then let's travel around the latent space make an a IID Gaussian a latent vector and ask the decoder of the VAE what the face looks like. And there's some people looking to the right over here. So the middle of it is the latent code zero. And then let's make Gaussian vectors that go around. There's some people looking to the left. There's a cluster of female faces with blonde hair. And th this is just 2D, so we can look at it. You can have an autoencoder with 20 dimensions. And um, the VAE can generate new images from Gaussian noise. So we made the VAE embed the latent data into a lower dimensional space. And that's no different than UMAP or TSNE or any other dimension reduction method. But we added the one characteristic that all the latent codes have to sit in a multi-dimensional multi Gaussian distribution. How did we make that happen? We tuned the weights of the encoder so that where the data went, 
resemble the uh, n-dimensional Gaussian distribution. And fortunately, if you have fake data and real data, and they each have distributions, we have this mathematical metric, the KL divergence, uh, is actually not a metric, it's a distance, that will tell you whether the encoding has been going well. Uh, and th this, this is great. So let's do brain. This, again, is not our work. It's by uh, Walter Pinay and George Cardoso at KCL. So they feed in every brain, T1, T2, patients, controls. And then they say, let's have the, um, it's not a variation autoencoder, it's a diffusion model. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit uh, the difference. But the principle is somewhat similar, that you want a latent space that will allow you to generate the full diversity and richness uh, of the data that's going in. And uh, we asked some radiologists, does this look like a brain? I don't know if you think it looks like a brain. I mean, one of the reasons it, it looks better is the cortical thickness when you run it through FreeSurfer is about right. I mean, you don't want to have a big, thick chunk of cortex or something, something like that. So in their paper, they say, and this is a cool paper to read, brain imaging generation with latent diffusion models. And I'd encourage you to read it. They also provide code, which is fun. They let you prescribe the ventricular volume, the brain volume. Uh, you can say the age and sex. Now, there's no such thing as the person with that age. It'll make a range of people with a certain age uh, and, and sex. And then they check whether it was reasonable. They measured with free surfer the ventricular volume of the output and found out whether it was doing uh, the thing that they, they, they asked. So before I tell you how it works, the first reason they did it was the following. They took a patient's image that looks like they have some bad, I don't know if that's a tumor, it look, look, looks like some uh, uh, big problem. And they passed that through a variational autoencoder trained only on healthy images and found that it could only make healthy images. It's only seen healthy images. So that's what it says that patient looks like because it hasn't seen any lesions. But they said, well, that's cool. Let's subtract the pseudo healthy closest image from the real image. And there it is, it's uh, the anomaly lab on, 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 the, on the right. So you could use autoencoders for lesion localization uh, under some assumptions, a couple of assumptions that this, that this is really gonna work. So I told you that they're not using variational autoencoders, they're using denoising diffusion probabilistic models, which are a little bit more complicated. Uh, but I'll tell you a little bit how they, how they work. Maybe we can even get this video to work. Maybe we can get it to play. Sorry, I'm a little... Maybe you've seen this before. I cannot get the cursor to show. Oh, there it is. All right, so two weeks ago, uh, Kwai Shu released Kling. And you can type into it, please show me a gentleman eating noodles or a little boy eating a hamburger. Does that look good? It kind of looks, uh, doesn't look fake to me. How, how, why is this so good? I mean, why, why is it so good? So. A DDPM, which is the basis of uh, OpenEye Sora, uh, DALI 3, or Midjourney, which make images, and, and Sora and Kling, which make videos. Use a generative AI principle called a denoising diffusion probabilistic model. And so again, what does a generative AI model do? It learns from training data what the characteristics of real data are, and then it will generate realistic examples of that distribution of training data, either anything, or in brain imaging, we usually just don't want any brain image. We want a brain image that satisfies certain properties. It has a certain volume, age, sex. It re represents uh, a subset of the training distribution. They use a VAE to embed the imaging data. Um, they use a diffusion process on probability distributions. Remember how the VAE took the latent space embedding, which comes from an encoder neural network, and moved the parameters of the encoder such that that then overlapped with a multivariate Gaussian that you could sample from and then make images. So this is a slightly different way of getting the encoded data to match um, the data distribution and sample realistic examples from it. And I, I know Sergei is going to tell you about units. We'll, we'll talk about how these images are such high quality uh, as well. Um, and you can either generate any image or you could use a text or vector classifier as guidance for conditional data generation. So if you say, I'd like an image of a little girl or a little boy, or I'd like them to look 60 years old, you can either specify that as a vector, like the number 60, and um, I mean, it'll go and get training examples that satisfy that property, um, and then it will uh, proceed uh, to make you an image uh, that should be realistic. Okay, so DDPMs, uh, 
were investigated by Yasha Sol Dickstein at, at MIT for some time before there was any application here in a field of statistical thermodynamics. So let, let's say you took an image, and this is an image of four people's bedroom, and you add Gaussian noise stochastically. This is the Langevin diffusion equation. Um, this is just an update rule that says change the image at every time step uh, by adding independent uh, uh, IID Gaussian noise and turn it into Gaussian noise. And then you can train a neural network to reverse the noise process. You say, wait, wait a minute, Paul, how did we get a dog? There was no dog in the noise. Well, at each step, let's say you give it the third to last and, and fourth to last image. There's kind of a dog there in the third to last image. And we want to get a little bit better. And you remember the MNIST digits. If we were doing digits, it would actually be pretty easy to do this. Because if you have a, 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 a something with a one in it, Maybe it becomes a seven, but it doesn't become a dog. I mean, if the training data is well-defined, there's a very, very tiny subclass of the infinite space of images that will be reasonable extensions uh, of this. So these um, uh, models are trained to approximate something called the score function. So I haven't told you what that is. The score function is the, well, let's go back a step. The score function is the change in the image that would improve its realism. So at every pixel, how can we change that pixel either brighter or darker or a different color so that it improves the realism? What is the realism? The realism is how well it matches the training data. So if the training data is faces, um, if it, it looks like it comes from the distribution of training data, we'll give it a good score. And this score function, which is the gradient with respect to x, the different uh, parts of the image, of the logarithm of the probability of the image being real uh, is being estimated. So you can train these. Uh, they do work. They make images. Um, the physicists will recognize this as the Fokker-Planck equation. So it's kind of cool. So you can either think of these SDEs as flows in the image space. How do we restore an image to make it look like a, a dog or a cat or, or, or a brain? Or you can say, well, what's happening to the latent vectors? I mean, when we embed this using a, an encoder a neural network, how does the training data embedding resemble real data? And you can um, essentially change the image with certain prompts or guidances to make the image uh, follow a certain pattern or category that we, 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 we prefer. So a DDPM, just to recap, is guided by a neural network estimate of the score function, which brings the image gradually closer to the training data distribution. Optionally, a conditioning term such as a classifier, which is Alzheimer's or control, or that the image contains a dog, that term is added. So we want it to make a realistic image. We'd like to have a Lagrangian multiplier on a term that says, please make an image that has a high conditional class probability of being a dog, or someone who's 60, or a patient with Alzheimer's disease. And so unlike classifier training, where you obtain the gradients of the weight parameters, we're actually changing the image. This isn't ch changing the neural network, it's changing the image. Um, and for those of you who are uh, physicists, the noising PDE takes the data you have and takes it onto an uh, isotropic normal. The reverse PDE, which makes images, reverses the model distribution uh, and turns it into the data distribution. And so you can either think of this as a flow on probability densities uh, or an evolution process on images. When you reverse the PDE, you turn the noise off. Uh, and it'll make uh, um, data that resembles the data uh, uh, distribution. So we've talked about denoising diffusion probabilistic models. DDIM, or denoising diffusion implicit models, turn the noise off in the reverse uh, SDE. And you can say, I would like an image that looks like this patient, um, but could you train it on normal data, and the VAE will give you a normal-looking brain that looks like that person, and the difference might be the pathology. Same thing with DDM is way better. It's, it's getting, this again is a diffusion model trained on healthy brains. You give it a patient's brain and it'll find the closest that it can generate using normal brains. And there's this beautiful map uh, of, of abnormal, abnormality. And so generative AI can simulate the reverse law progression of disease uh, on the individual's own brain anatomy uh, and subtract a healed uh, image of the person. And you say, wait a minute, I, I, you're getting really carried away. This is this make all sorts of things. How do we validate this? So, I mean, let's say you want to 
you know, a, a student has a project to make schizophrenia brains. I mean, how do, how do we validate that it's making brains that have the richness and the properties and the distributional expectations of, uh, 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 that we would normally have? So often you'll use within subject longitudinal data to verify that the progression or interpolation that these models provide is, is realistic. But it's really difficult to test if the generative distribution resembles the real distribution. One approach is GANs, generative adversarial networks, where you train a classifier to tell if the data is fake or real. Um, within the family of GANs, the best way to verify uh, a generative model is working. There's some theory called reproducing kernel Hilbert space theory uh, that those of you that took uh, functional analysis will know fondly. The work of Arthur Gretton is very good on this subject. It's, it's on uh, uh, minimum mean divergence, which is, let me try and phrase this in an intuitive way. If there was anything about the fake image that was clearly fake, you could define some feature to, to, to detect it. And so it might be a convolution filter, or it might be a test function. You might take the image and do the integral of the image with respect to some pattern. Um, that is a reproducing kernel. And so you can find kernels that discriminate fake and real images. And this whole theory of reproducing kernel in Hilbert space says, search over all kernels. So I'm not going to tell you the fake data looks good enough just because it passes one test. Let's search over all kernels. And the whole mathematical theory is, is very beautiful. Uh, Vince Calhoun sent me this cool example. So this is uh, denoising uh, probabilistic models making resting state networks. Uh, you give it a whole lot of uh, resting state functional data. And um, in this case, the classifier guidance says, please have this re resemble the default mode network. Uh, so just to sort of recap what's going on, a generative model will do three things. It will make a latent space embedding of training data that is organized in, into a, the space of a continuous distribution you can sample from. And then the decoder will make, in the case of the training data, the input again. In the case of specified data, you say, well, I don't really want just any image. I'd like to have a classifier guidance. I've trained another classifier that detects a disease or people of a certain age. And so the um, measure of fitness of the generated image should evolve you through the latent space in such a way that you pick images that are more like a certain class, either Alzheimer's or a disease or a certain uh, uh, category. So you could apply this to, um, it doesn't have to be T1. Uh, you, you can put tracts in, uh, do some diffusion tractometry. This is work by Wendy Fang in our lab. And you know that when you run tractometry, they don't look like this. I mean, they look like spaghetti. They don't look this good. So you could use a variational encoder to QC your data. You could say, well, I think compressive techniques like VAEs get rid of outliers very, very well. Uh, we'll run that. Um, and so the many, many methods, this is by Bram Chandio in our group, are tidying up tractography by using uh, autoencoders uh, to eliminate the spurious uh, streamlines. They're really good. They seem to work really, really well. Uh, and this is deep normative tractometry uh, for identifying joint white white matter micro and microstructural anomalies, again, work by Wendy Feng uh, in our group. You just feed the whole connectome into a VAE. Um, and, uh, so one, one last thing. I'm going to try and do this in three minutes. A different class of generative AI, which is called neural style transfer, is also useful in imaging, either for improving images, changing an image to look like it was collected on a different scanner, or synthesizing PET from MRI. So this is kind of cool. So let's say Monet painted this painting and you want a photograph of it. Well, I don't know. You, you, you could train something that takes paired data paintings and photos uh, and, and tries to do a good job of this style transfer. What happens there is, let's say you have an image that has a certain content. You want it to have the style of a Monet painting. And the thing in the middle is what you want to generate. You want to conditionally generate an image with a different style but with the requirement that it matches the content of the input. You could think of another Lagrangian optimization in which, um, well, let's make it easier. There's a sports car driving along the Pacific. There's a Van Gogh painting. And let's say, for whatever reason, you'd like a Van Gogh image of your sports car. You can run um, uh, the training of a convolutional neural network that will estimate the discrepancy between the synthesized image uh, and the content of the first image and the style of the second. And the style is encoded in the 
correlations between channels of the layers of your uh, convolutional neural network. The so-called gram matrix, uh, which has a dimension equal to the number of feature maps squared, is the correlation between the feature maps and the layers of your CNN. Um, and for whatever reason, people figured this uh, contained the style. So you could say, I'd like the outputs to resemble the style. The correlation of the features has to be like this. Uh, and also should match the content. So you can uh, harmonize images. This is work by Neda Jahanshad and Ming Ting Lu. Let's get it to work. Where you specify a new scanner and have the neural style transfer make. It doesn't look very good, but on the bottom there you can see these images are being uh, style transferred to another scanner. Uh, or, or you can do something kind of cool. That's the network design. You can do something kind of cool. You can say, I've got 10 sites data. Let's match all the data to look like HCP because that's good quality. And you can see that classification improves. Or you can, I'll, I'll show you an example. You can synthesize new contrast. So if you have plenty of um, PET data and MRI data, you can say, can you make me some amyloid PET scans uh, from multimodal MRI? This doesn't really work. I'm pretending it works. It, it, it works OK. So just to wrap up, um, I think I'll skip this because I want to give uh, time for questions. Um, then this is cool. So come back and hear Chow Gant. He'll tell you about this. Um, things to be careful of. So be careful that you don't um, lock on to confounding features that weren't generalized. Um, make sure that your algorithms are fair, that they should work well for everyone, and that they're trained on diverse data. There is a clever way of making sure your algorithms don't fail when they see new data. So this work by Nicola Dinsdale and Anna Nambaretti at Oxford University trained an Alzheimer's detector, which also was trained to tell which scanner was used and other confounds such as age and sex. And they used a so-called adversarial deconfounding autoencoder. So this is our friend, the autoencoder, making the images. But it says, if I can tell from the features used which site you scanned the person at, that's bad because it might have locked on something that only occurs at that site. So this is trained end-to-end -end as a compound loss functional. It has to decode the data accurately, and the adversary has to, tell, has to not be able to tell where the data came from. And then you get an embedding that is deconfounded, is transferable across scanners, and still encodes the biological signals that we require uh, to do the, the classification. So just to wrap up, um, we did a guided tour of AI and neuroimaging. Um, and there were two main branches of AI that we talked about. Discriminative AI takes a lot of data and, and reduces it to one number or one statement, uh, such as disease detection with CNNs, vision transformers, uh, and hybrids. And explainable AI will help you show the features used. We talked about occlusion sensitivity analysis, grad cam, and we didn't talk about attention flow, but that's a lot of fun if you use transformers. Uh, and th this has major applications in radiology. People are using this. Uh, today. Generative AI will create new data that resembles the distribution of training data. So it's not making a decision, it's making new data. Um, and you could say, why do I want new data? Well, you might want to synthesize amyloid PET from MRI, which I just told you isn't really possible, but you can try. Uh, you can enhance the images you have, you can change them into a style from a different scanner. Um, and you can also um, potentially see pathologies we can't yet see with imaging if you have enough uh, PET data. But care is needed to model the site and scanner and data set confounds. We looked at one approach for deconfounding using an uh, 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 adversary on the feature space. Uh, but then most of all, you can train methods on enough data to make sure that they are, are, are fair. So if you want, you can join Enigma. Uh, we're having an Enigma party on Tuesday night. If you want to come, you meet a lot of other people that are, are scanning people. Um, and uh, thanks to all the people who provided the mathematics, methods, and scans. And thanks again to Angie and all of you for making this possible. I, I guess we have uh, time for one quick question. And there's just a microphone down here. So if you have questions, please come, come down. <laughs> Thank you for interesting lecture. Uh, can diffusion model extract a picture like an uh, autoencoder? Diffusion model, can diffusion model extract picture like a variation autoencoder? Yes. Oh. So that, that, that's a great question. Can a diffusion model extract features like an autoencoder? So 
there's a class of diffusion model called a latent diffusion model. And they're faster to train. And so an LDM, it does exactly what you said. It, it uses a, usually a variational autoencoder to pre-encode uh, the data. And you could say, that couldn't possibly work. If I JPEG compressed my images and just used the JPEG coefficients, I mean, all the things we expect wouldn't work. But oddly, it does work. So I think to answer your question, why don't we just use LDMs because they uh, produce a feature compression? They have a little bit of an issue with faithful reproduction of data. And so if you ask around who's been running diffusion models on brain images, some people, including Vince Calhoun, who might be here, I don't know if he's here, I asked him that question. And he said, if you use DDPM, it's slower, better images. If you use LDM, you get latent vectors. And so I guess we'll see. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. I actually checked the room yesterday. I saw this room is bigger enough. It seems that we have a very big crowd down here. So we do have some empty space down here. Please, the people uh, at the door, you can move. And also people sit on the other side. If possible, you can move on this side so people can flow easily. And that makes things much easier. So uh, thank you for coming. So I will just, you know, a few minutes, like maybe we switch a bit just so that we, we get more crowd down here. Then we can leave some rooms down there so people can walk in any time. It, it's full. It's really full. So this room actually can, can have 250 capacities, but it's still full. Thank you so much. I'm glad to see so many people are interested in this topic. So we still have seats on the first two rows. It seems like the front rows is always... <laughs> and people see in the back corner, in the back, perhaps you can move down here too, so then uh, we give some room to people who can come in later. Thank you so much. So let me introduce our second speaker, uh, Dr. Sui. And he, she is a professor from uh, State K Lab uh, in, uh, in China. And she's from Beijing Normal University. And that's the best in na national neuroscience you know, labs in China. So I'm very glad to have her to join us today. That's welcome. 